everyone. Um, I would like first to uh, welcome everyone. My name is Rebecca Matthias Jimenez. I'm a PhD candidate here at UVic. And I'm Keith Chair. I'm a PhD candidate here at UVic as well. And we're joining you from the University of Victoria's Center for Global Studies. Yeah, we would like to welcome everyone in the room uh, and ask you please not to share your screens, only the participants, okay? Um, so I want to offer you all a warm welcome today to our mm -hmm. webinar, which is part of a series on current global challenges from transatlantic <coughs> perspective. So one of the main goals with our webinar series is to bring together in one virtual space researchers, mm -hmm. professionals, and the wider public from a diversity of backgrounds to discuss emerging and innovative topics. So today we will be looking at current challenges and opportunities in democracies around the world, focusing in particular on North-South relations, alternative traditions of democracy, and counter-hegemonic knowledges. So this is being recorded and it will be available later on a YouTube channel. So before I introduce our speakers today, uh, let me acknowledge that this series is being co-hosted by the UCANET Initiative at the Center for Global Studies here at UVic and co-funded by our generous support of the Erasmus Plus program of the European Union. And I'd like to acknowledge that this webinar is being hosted today from the unceded territories of the Saanich, Lekwungen, and Wyoming peoples. And to acknowledge that uh, a lot of us today are uninvited guests on these lands. And I know a lot of the other participants are joining us from other unceded territories. So I wanted to acknowledge that as guests in someone else's home, we have special responsibilities of care towards the home that we're in and of solidarity towards our hosts. And even those of us who are not tuning in today from Indigenous territories have been beneficiaries of Indigenous dispossession in one way or another. And so we share in that responsibility too. And I just wanted to acknowledge that and acknowledge our responsibilities in the hopes that we can bear those in mind today and in the hopes that our conversation today can be, uh, can be a part of our efforts to live up to those responsibilities together. Uh, so before I hand things over to our guest speakers, um, I have just a few housekeeping items that I would like to run through with you today. Um, so at the end of the presentation or the dialogue, we will have some time for questions and answers. So questions can be addressed on the chat box in your, uh, on the bottom part of your screen. Uh, to get a sense of the community, if you haven't done so, I would like to ask you now to say your name, uh, where you are joining it, us from, and which institution you're part of. Uh, and while I do that, um, I would like to introduce uh, our speakers today. It's such an honor uh, to introduce Boaventura de Souza Santos. Uh, he's a professor in sociology at the University of Coimbra in Portugal and a distinguished legal scholar at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Wisconsin is the director of the Center for Social Studies at the University of Coimbra and has written and published widely on issues of globalization, sociology of law and the state, epistemology, social movements, and the World Social Forum. Some of his world-renowned books are Epistemologies of the South, The Rise of the Global Left, and If God Were a Human Rights Activist. And James Tully is an emeritus professor of political science, law, indigenous governance, and philosophy. He's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, an emeritus fellow of the Trudeau Foundation, and the author of 11 authored and edited volumes and over 90 chapters and articles, including Strange Multiplicity, Public Philosophy in a New Key, On Global Citizenship, and Resurgence and Reconciliation. Jim specializes in public philosophy, constitutionalism, nonviolence, civic engagement, and indigenous settler relations. So this webinar is just the first event of a much larger discussion that we are hosting here at UVic. Uh, we're hosting some of the world leading uh, democratic theorists to discuss democracy and its futures. So if you are in Victoria, please, you're welcome to join us on March 22nd 
at the First People's House at 1.45 p.m. for this great dialogue that we will be hosting. We're also uh, holding a live stream event on March the 19th that brings together leading academics and local politicians to discuss the challenge of public debate in turbulent times, academia and media. And our Democracy in its Futures conference is going to be focusing on three broad questions. And today we're going to be asking our speakers to, uh, to discuss those questions together for about 10 minutes each. So rather than each speaker speaking separately, both, uh, both speakers will discuss all three questions. And all told, they'll have about half an hour to do that before we'll open it up to questions from the audience. So the, the uh, questions we'll be asking our speakers to address are, what are the major problems facing democracies? So uh, the second question is, what are the connections between these problems that democracy is facing? And third, what are the democratic ways to resolve those problems and reconcile all affected by them? So um, we will give the floor to you, Boaventura and Jim. Uh, it's a, such a pleasure to have you here. So feel free to engage in this uh, conversation, the three questions that we're proposing. Uh, and we will have about 30 minutes in total to discuss these three questions. So we will um, stop sharing our screen right now so you two can have the floor. And Bo Ventura, perhaps you'd like to start us off by uh, giving us your thoughts on the challenges that are facing democracies today. Thank you. Okay. It's such a pleasure <laughs> to be discussing with you and, of course, with my dear friend, uh, uh, Jim. It's a pity that I, I won't be able uh, to be with you next week because I'm uh, you know, I can't do transcontinental flights uh, twice a month. And I just came from uh, Colombia because I'm a member of the Truth Commission that was created after the end uh, of the conflict between the government, the state, and the guerrilla group uh, FARC. And uh, we are in a deep trouble. And that democracy in Colombia, and particularly because Colombia is also having a very aggressive position vis-a-vis -vis Venezuela. You may wonder what uh, does this information uh, have to do with our discussion? Well, this is precisely, I think, the topic that we are discussing. Democracies are dying democratically, basically. That is to say, we don't see the usual way of uh, coup, military coups or other coups that destroy democracy. We have seen before in 1932, Hitler won two elections. Uh, and we have seen that we are more and more in the world. We are electing democratically and in normal constitutional conditions, we are electing to the presidency or to the office anti-democrats. I think that Donald Trump has very little to do with democracy. Uh, Jair Bolsonaro in Brazil has very little to do. Uh, Macri in Argentina. And I could go on and on. So there is something deeply wrong with the kind of democracy uh, that we are, uh, you know, living through. So my, 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 my question, I think it's a very important question. I think that more and more I come to realize that uh, democracy is incompatible with the kind of capitalism that rules the world today. So we either have democracy or capitalism, quite frankly. Why? Because uh, the, the, among the different factions of capital that historically have ruled the world since the 16th century, uh, we are uh, in a period in which financial capital dominates all the other uh, areas of capital. Uh, for instance, productive capital. Financial capital is antisocial because it doesn't 
even lead or deal with people because uh, productive capital needs workers. Financial capital uh, needs a screen in the computer and nothing more. Uh, so it creates wealth out of wealth. So it's an unending process. And there's uh, financial capital because it's absolutely globalized as much as the internet, the two powers with no boundaries today, uh, they are really trying to uh, rule the world in a way that is incompatible with the principles that underlie democracy, even low-intensity democracy, as I understand it. I think that I have been uh, writing, and Jim and we are uh, both agree on this, that we representative democracy, liberal democracy, is uh, a regime that uh, leads us to live in a situation which is a little bit contradictory, because our societies are politically democratic, but socially fascistic. Because many people in our societies don't have the real experience of democracy. They live in democratic societies, but their lives are run in authoritarian ways, outside any democratic control or democratic rule. There are people that, uh, in fact, conduct their undignifying lives in democratic, so-called democratic societies. So our democratic societies, as far as they don't address the forms of power in our world, are becoming crippled more and more, and uh, they will probably won't survive. And uh, that's why we should be so concerned. And to finalize my first point, I just want to mention that I think I see the world with three modes of domination that are currently controlling the world. <clears throat> Capitalism, colonialism, and heteropatriarchy. It was a mistake, even by Marxists, as myself in my training, to consider that colonialism was over after the independence of the 19th century and 20th century. What ended was the historical capitalism, colonialism, not colonialism. Colonialism goes on as racism, as xenophobia, as the way in which we manage to deal with so many people as subhuman beings. The refugees that die in the Mediterranean Sea that used to be a network of globalization and now is a liquid cemetery, these people are victims of colonialism real colonialism, today's colonialism. And these three dominations work in tandem. Colonialism, capitalism, and heteropatriarchy. One does not exist without the other. And that's why, for instance, in Brazil, when they elect a very aggressive pro-capitalist president that is uh, poised to destroy all the social rights in that society, simultaneously, as capitalism becomes more aggressive, the genocide of uh, black youth increases tremendous, tremendously in the cities of Brazil. And the violence against women almost increases. Feminicide, as we call it. So these three forms of domination go together. And the drama of our world is that our resistance is fragmented. Domination is totalizing. Our resistance is fragmented. For instance, trade unions and leftist parties that used to be anti-capitalist were very often sexist and racist. Many women's movement, feminist movement, is very often racist and pro-capitalist. And some anti-colonial movements and anti-racist movements are very often sexist and pro-capitalist. That is to say, resistance is fragmented. 
we don't articulate social movements while domination works in tandem in an articulated way. So what can democracy do? What is democracy after all? Well, I'll give you, just to provoke my dear friend Jim, my definition of democracy. Democracy is any initiative in any field of social life that aims at replacing unequal power relations by shared authority relations. This is democracy. And therefore, democracy in the public field, of course, but also at home, in schools, on the streets, in the hospitals, in our universities. So I think democracy does not exist. What exists is democratizing processes and undemocratizing processes. And we are undergoing a period of undemocratization in the world. It's a reactionary cycle. And I call it reactionary and not conservative, because the conservatives abide by the principles of the French Revolution, even though they give priority to liberty, to freedom, and all the, the two others, equality and fraternity, will be dealt with in some way. The reactionaries don't even accept the French Revolution principles. So that's what I call in my most recent book, which, by the way, you did mention, Rebecca, which is The End of the Cognitive Empire, published by Duke University Press. I really make a call for the abyssal exclusions in our society, what I call the abyssal line, that divides our society between the metropolitan sociability and the colonial sociability. Democracy never reaches colonial sociability. That's why democracy is too little, too little powerful. That's why I think that in order to be really Democrats today, we have to be anti-capitalists, anti-colonialists, and anti hetero patriarchy patriarchal type of people. And now I mute. Well, that's a very difficult uh, introduction to follow. And I'll try my best. I've learned an enormous amount from Boaventura de Souza Santos. And I agree with the uh, analysis he just gave us of the present situation. And even with his definition of democracy, I want to just uh, speak about it in a slightly different way, but in a complementary way. Uh, we both come out of slightly different traditions of thought and of practice. And I think we all agree that there are huge problems of social and ecological injustice that we're facing today. The United Nations on Wednesday released yet another report on the fact that millions of people are dying from unsustainable exploitive practices on the planet. And these are having boomerang effects on social inequality, life conditions, well-being, and this is, is our systems theorists tell us, our vicious cycles that are getting worse. We're in the midst of a sixth mass extinction, and I could go through all these problems, but I think we all know them. The second point about them is, what's the connection between the social and ecological problems is that they're caused by the very processes of modernization that Boa was talking about, that we've developed and we've become deeply dependent on for the last 400 years. Now, we've known this since the 1950s. Carl Polanyi called it the great disembedding and transformation, precisely what Boa was speaking about. Then Barry Commoner came along in 1970, the founder of ecology here in North America, and said, these processes disembed us from the ecological systems that we live in and depend on, and make it appear to us that we are independent of them, 
and can command and control and extract and develop from them as if they were objects out there rather than the very conditions of life in which, on which we all depend. And then this was put on scientific footing as early as 1971 in the limits to growth. So we've known about these problems and the real tragedy is not that there haven't been attempts to do things through representative institutions, but quite often that the solutions are within the, within the systems that are causing the problem in the first place. That's what people mean when they say these are vicious systems of social and ecological injustice. So that's the situation we're in in 2019. And I want to turn to one feature of Boa's work that has been of fundamental importance to people around the world. And one of his mantras was early on that there's no global justice without epistemic justice. And what he meant by that, if we keep using the dominant forms of knowledge that legitimate the very processes of production and consumption and disposal that are causing the problems that he just outlined for us, if we keep using those knowledges, we're reproducing uh, the conditions that are, quite frankly, unsustainable. And so the idea that there's no global justice without epistemic justice, he's pointing to us to counter forms of epistemologies, modes of knowing, forms of practices available on the planet, but not within the dominant technosphere. And this is what he calls the global south. Whether these practices are in the geographic north or the south, they're practices of a counter-modernity type that are based around ecological economics, through community-based organizations, through small d democracy. So my project was to look at these community-based practices of small d democracy of people working together, sharing power together, reasoning together, and trying to develop sustainable social relations, and those in turn deeply embedded in sustainable relation to the ecosystems on which they depend. And these democratic communities of practice I call Gaia citizenship or Gaia democracy, because these are people around the planet who are non-cooperating with the processes that are unsustainable and then developing communities of practice that are sustainable both so socially and ecologically. So we have a kind of counter world of not just counter epistemologies grounded in practice but the practices themselves are counter democracies to the dominant representative model. And what we're doing here at UVic is mapping these, and there are millions of them throughout the world, and there are four general types of what I call Gaia democracies. That's to say that their major concern is to develop forms of social organization that are sustainable, but they're also sustainable in a way that they sustain the ecosystems on which they co-depend, so hence Gaia democracy. The first of these is indigenous democracies around the world. Indigenous people have not been completely colonized by these processes of modernization that Boa mentioned, but rather are continuing practices that have been going on for 12,000 years here on the northwest coast, but for 95% of the history of Homo sapiens. They have lived within their social systems and their ecosystems. So the return of and the regeneration of indigenous knowledges, indigenous practices of democracy couldn't be more important at the present moment to see that there, there are these archipelagos of hope available to us and to learn from through, the organized, through their own organizations, through the United Nations traditional ecological knowledge and practice and so on. The second example of democratic practices that are addressing social and ecological injustices are community-based organizations that Paul mentioned and has done a lot of work himself and we do here 
again, too many to mention in a 10 minute introduction, but it's important to see there's this, what we might call a local and global permaculture of another world, not only that it's possible, but it's actually actual. And it is small d participatory democracy, and it's sustainable. It's cyclical economics, it's uh, mutual aid, it draws on all these cooperative practices that have developed in the West and in the non-West and experiments with them. So indigenous people, community-based organizations, and then a third movement is an attempt at the international level to disrupt international trade agreements and so on with democratic contestation of this whole layer of law now that is above these competing nation states and isn't even accessible if we were successful in our representative institutions because most of the international trade agreements have been worked up by very large multinational corporations precisely to avoid uh, democratic say within them. So there's a whole modality of protests going on now at the international level to try somehow to democratize global law. And our colleague Angie Biner at her Center for Global Studies at the University of Hamburg is coming to this conference at the University of Victoria and that's her specialty and Fauna Foreman, who's the uh, head of the Center for Global Studies at UC San Diego, is working in this area as well. And I put all these three types of counter-democracies together and just call them Gaia democracy, because they're making that crucial turn. I, many of you will remember Aldo Leopold's book, Sand County Almanac, in 1949, where he says, the route to a sustainable future is that we all see ourselves as plain members and citizens of the biotic communities we inhabit and on which we depend. And then uh, Sir James Lovelock developed this with the Gaia hypothesis that we see ourselves outside of these, uh, the ecology or the environment and seeing it simply as a storehouse of resources to exploit Whereas we have to make this turn back to seeing ourselves as participants in and dependent on the social and ecological relationships that sustain life on Earth. So that's, I will push my mute. My, my. Well, I, may I, um, you know, not respond? I mean, I, you know that I'm, uh, I agree with all of you have been uh, saying, and in fact, my my most of my work in recent years have been very much focused on the epistemic justice, on other conceptions of life, and of knowledge, other ways of knowing, and uh, the projects that we conducted here uh, even led us to a new concept, which is now in English, in Portuguese, and Spanish, and is coming out in a collection at Routledge by, uh, um, called the, the uh, a collection, a series called Epistemologies of the South, it is the concept of demodiversity. So I think that we need as much biodiversity as we need demodiversity. There's a different ways of uh, conceiving of and practicing democracy. And in order to do that, in fact, we need an epistemological rupture or change of paradigm, and I've been conducting this based on my work with social movements, because I think, for me, epistemologies of the South are processes of validating uh, the knowledge is born in struggles, struggles against capitalism, against colonialism, and against heteropatriarchy, by people that very often are, uh, of course, very much, un, you know, undignified by life, they are marginalized, victimized, made invisible, discredited, and very often unknown, made invisible. And uh, therefore, this knowledge born in struggle is for me of crucial importance, because it brings us the possibility of working, and I agree with you, but I would compliment in a different way. That is to say, I think that we are at a stage in which we have to work 
And the, the struggle, which is my basic concept today, is the concept of struggle, is that one struggle, one, one foot inside the state and the institutions, and one foot outside the institutions. Because I think that we have to change both at the same time. And for that, we need different frameworks of knowledge and different frameworks of, even of the disciplines. For instance, let's, let's start with the example within the system. Uh, and I give you concrete examples. Uh, my concrete example is just for, for instance, in a recent election, in my Alice project, Bolivia, Ecuador, and uh, Brazil, and India, and Mozambique, South Africa, were part of this project. And then uh, in a recent election process in Bolivia, it so happened that 90% per of the population of a given community voted for one candidate. And the opposition immediately filed a complaint in uh, the electoral uh, court of Bolivia saying it is impossible that 99% of the people think alike and vote alike. This is a fraud and should be investigated. Well, the president of the electoral court, who is actually a good friend of mine, knew already something about what we call intercultural democracy. And they decided, in fact, not to investigate, but to do some research and go to the that, that community with people of the court, some uh, sociologists, anthropologists. And what they found out was the following. This community is an indigenous community that for, for four days, four days, they have been deliberating, meeting, to decide which would be the best candidate to serve the interests of the community. And along these four days of discussion, they came to the conclusion that this candidate, A, is our best candidate, is the one that can serve our system. And so they vote in bulk on this person. So it was a very high, deeply democratic process. They spend much more time deliberating that we do. We go to the vote, uh, the voting booth and just put your vote there. Well, this community spent four days deliberating. But if the, the president of the court was not aware of this difference, you'd consider a fraud because it was not a fraud, it was a deep exercise of democracy, because we don't know in representative democracy the idea of collective vote is one man, one vote. And therefore, we were trapped. Of course, this case was solved in, in a very good way and was considered, of course, a very genuine exercise of democracy. So this is a way in which sometimes we can work within the system to take it to the limits. To, to force the limits to the limit, because I think there are leeways still today in this process. But the other side, of course, is to work in outside the institutions, in grassroots organizations. And was an author, an Egyptian author, a good friend of mine also, he passed away recently, Samir Amin, that developed the concept of the delinking. The linking, uh, he, of course, he, was, he had in mind states, but we can also have in mind communities, uh, self-managed communities, which in my most recent work, and is the end of the cognitive empire, I call the liberated zones. So in our society, there are liberated zones that do not depend on capitalist economy and even institutions. They create self-managed forms of life. And uh, I have several examples in my work, as you have, here in, in, in British Columbia. And what is interesting in this case, for instance, I'll give you the example of Zavaleta. Zavaleta is one of the poorest neighborhoods in Buenos Aires. There is a neighborhood association there which really is developing a fabulous democratic work or community work, uh, care services, uh, soup, and, uh, soup kitchens, uh, popular education, popular university, in fact, I, I have been very involved with them in the creation of this popular university. And also other forms of, uh, of, of, of deliberating in the journal called Garganta Pudrosa, a, a powerful throat. So it's very interesting. What this means is that on the other side of the line, that is to say, on the side of the people that are 
abyssal excluded, that they are, they are very often considered as subhuman, as women were for a long time, indigenous people, uh, African people, Afro-descendant people outside Africa, as subhumans or Roma people now. I mean, these people, in fact, have other ways of understanding reality and going through life. And therefore, our concept of democracy is short because it is not the political, it is the economy, is feeding the people, is granting security, is education. Everything is democracy. And, the, and the democracy is too short because in our political science and political philosophy disciplines, we have really transformed uh, this totality into a specific field with this politics or public sphere or whatever. These are really embracing and totalizing uh, issues under different conceptions of human rights. For instance, the indigenous people now, even uh, again, one foot inside institutions, one foot outside the Article 71 of the Equatorian Constitution, the rights of the Pachamama, uh, the rights of Mother Earth, or now uh, the, 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 the sacred river of the Mahari in New Zealand recently declared as holding uh, human rights. So I think that we are at a period, uh, James, which is difficult because I think that uh, Gramsci was really right when he, he wrote that sometimes there are periods of interregnum. And I think that we live in a period between a globalization uh, that took us here, where we are now, and um, we are in a crisis. And this crisis, because this globalization was led by the United States and was based on a, on a, on a technological innovation, which was you know, the laptop, the cell phone, and everything. We are on the verge of a new globalization, which is artificial intelligence, automation, and robotics. And it looks like that China is better positioned to lead this globalization. So we are now facing a terrible, violent rivalry between the United States and China. And, uh, and you know, when this rivalry increases, as at the beginning of the 20th century, we had two world wars in Europe. And now you cannot understand what's happening in Brazil. You cannot understand what's happening in Venezuela, except for this rivalry, because what the United States wants is the oil of, of Venezuela as the oil of, of Brazil, which is much closer to the United States than the oil in the Middle East, which is closer to China. So, and this rivalry is leading these undemocratic processes all over the place. And you can see, even in Europe, how the extreme right, how Brexit was produced by, Brexit, by, by fake news. And now the, the, the United Kingdom doesn't know what to do with this monster. A monster created democratically in a referendum of participatory democracy, but of course manipulated by fake news. So I think that uh, it is with these two ideas, one one foot in the system. <clears throat> Why one foot? <clears throat> because they are not outright democracies, uh, uh, dictatorships. So they, they, they have some uh, formal aspects of democracy, some countries more than others. Of course, your country more than, uh, than, uh, than, uh, than Brazil. My country now, which is the only country run by a leftist government in Europe, a socialist plus communists and leftist bloc. But it's, it's kind of an exception. The world is moving in this sea of undemocratic forces undermining democracy. So I think that we want, I don't agree with this uh, David Ranciman and other pessimists that uh, say things like that, that, uh, you know, democracy was uh, at a beginning and will have an end, and therefore may be the end of democracy. I don't believe that, because they never asked this question, which for me is crucial, capitalism, started by not existing. It is not there forever, cannot be there forever. It's not, it's not there since the beginning of the world, and there is no need to think there will be no world beyond capitalism. I think that democracy will change, and probably will change to be a more encompassing type of structure, or then we'll, we'll live in a dystopia of little feudal castles and a chaotic field 
of battles and violent lives conducted by and people, uh, subhuman people, which is after all the recipe of the modernity in which humanity cannot be fulfilled. And my last note, uh, uh, Jim, is that as you and me, as activists, also, we cannot afford to be outright pessimists. Uh, in my case, I'm a Spinozian, and uh, for Spinoza, you have two effects, fear and hope. And one needs the other. And of course, hope without fear is terrible, but fear without hope is also terrible. Most people in the world today have, are fearful and have no hope. And a few have only hope. I think that we have to instill fear into the only hopeful ones and instill freedom, uh, uh, hope, and give hope to those that are just fearful. So this is our task as public scholars and also as uh, activists. And uh, it's such a pleasure to have the occasion to discuss this with you. Well, that was simply wonderful. There was so much in that. We, I think we should turn to the uh, audience in a, uh, fairly quickly, because I'm sure people have lots of good questions. But I just want to add something. I, too, agree uh, uh, with one foot in the representative institutions. You can't just abandon them. And the other foot in community-based participatory uh, practices of democracy. And I, I call this joining hands between two quite distinct types of citizenship. I call that civic when it's uh, community-based and participatory and civil when it's in the representative institutions. And it seems to me, both from what you've said and my own thinking, is that there are two coordination problems here. One coordination amongst your demo democracies around the world the World Social Forum tried to bring be a place where people could get together and share ideas and so on. So that's one coordination problem. There are so many people doing things around the world, but it's not very well connected. But then the second coordination problem is coordinating the relationship between participatory Democrats like 15M in Spain and representative movements like Podemos. That's a real challenge. And we have Dr. Pablo Ozil here, who is working in this area, as you know, you've met him. But that, so there's a kind of double coordination problem. If we could solve that, uh, we would be on our way to creating a permaculture of sustainable democratic practices around the planet that would be resilient enough to survive this clash uh, that we see between China and the United States over the few uh, natural resources that are uh, haven't been already destroyed. And we need what we need now is resiliency in these counter practices or counter institutions. And I want to say that uh, I think we have to turn to Gandhi here, both for his nonviolence, but also for his mantra, really, Gandhi's mantra was non-cooperation with systems of injustice and then turn and cooperate with alternative institutions that are sustainable and are just and are self-organized. And we've got to think always now in this uh, two ways. How do we non-cooperate with these self-destructive uh, systems that we've got ourselves caught up in withdraw our producing and consuming capabilities from them, and then find ways to insert them into sustainable practices and gradually build up these practices until we reach various kinds of tipping points. It may look like it's way too slow of a process, but I think if we keep a foot in each in the representative institutions and in the communities of democratic practice, we can build up a resilient, homo sapien societies that could survive the, uh, the unsustainable drift of the dominant institutions. I'll leave it at that for now.
a footnote to you. Uh, um, it's very interesting what you just said. Uh, just a footnote, because I just came, when I said I was in Colombia, and then I came through Barcelona and Spain. And I have been working very much in uh, collaborating with Podemos, and uh, which the, the leftist party in Spain. And I'm working very much with them. Elections are coming up. And uh, it was, in fact, one of my, uh, you know, the practical examples of uh, my theoretical work on how to combine participatory democracy with representative democracy. Because uh, Podem was organized for representative democracy, but with the circle of citizens and so on. So I have studied them. I have worked with them on this. And I have to say that today I'm very skeptical. So I'm, I have to say this. I mean, the ways in which these participatory ele elements have been replaced, and I'm a good friend of the leaders of the party. No, no question about that. I'm in solidarity with them. But I'm very critical because, in fact, the participatory element has been corrupted, and many people don't participate anymore. So I think there are strong inertias that destroy the participatory momentum that sometimes evolves in societies. As you know, I was one of the founders of the World Social Forum, which is defunct now. And in 2020, we are going to have the, the International Sociological Association is going to meet in Porto Alegre. And most of the panels is about the future of the World Social Forum or the social forum of the future. And so. There is uh, these initiatives. We are at a point in which we have seen our initiatives sometimes getting just, just one friendly footnote to that. Here on the north, here on the northwest coast. There's a background noise here that I'm getting, Boa? Okay, there. Yes. I, do, I just want to mention one experiment on the Northwest Coast, and this relates to the work that Keith and Rebecca are also doing, and we call it Resurgence and Reconciliation, and it's an attempt to bring indigenous people and settler folks together to resurge, to regenerate communities of practice that are indigenous, but are in joining hands with uh, settler communities, and to work through practices of reconciliation, both locally and then extending that across Turtle Island, across North America. So again, there are lots of these examples. I don't want to uh, go into this further, but just to say that here in the Northwest Coast, we talk about it in these terms of resurgence and reconciliation. Oh, thank you both so much for that discussion. That was uh, such a rich dialogue. We're going to start to transition now into the question and answer part of our webinar. I just want to check, can everybody hear me OK now? Yeah? Okay, uh, we thought we'd start off with a couple uh, uh, clarificatory questions, just to draw out some of the terms that you've each used so that all of our audience members have some common ground. So Jim, I was hoping you could start by explaining a little more what you mean about Gaia democracy. And then after that, Boa, perhaps you could speak a little bit about uh, abyssal lines and abyssal exclusions and what you mean by those terms. Thank you. Yeah, Repeat your democracy. Last question. Last question. Yes, let me repeat the question. Uh, so, Jim, we were hoping you would speak to Gaia democracy and what you mean by that term, and then Boa, afterwards, you could speak to abyssal exclusions and what you mean. Thank you. Yes, I'm happy to do this. Gaia democracy refers to Gaia as the living earth, the biosphere in which we live and every breath we take and every bite of food we eat 
depends on the sustainability of the biosphere. We are members of it and deeply dependent on it in every breath we take. For 3.8 billion years, this biosphere, which we know to be, as far as we know, is absolutely unique. Uh, we haven't found another planet that has a biosphere like this. And it has survived and grown in complexity for 3.8 billion years through symbiosis, through relationships of gift reciprocity with all forms of life. So what Gaia democracy means, sometimes called biomimicry, we have to design, design our democratic and uh, economic systems so they are sustainable, they are cyclical, they take into account that these social systems are embedded in ecosystems that are sustainable in this symbiotic way. So it's a, a reintegration of Homo sapiens back into the social and economic or ecological relationships that sustain all life. And it's a, a movement that, that I say began with Aldo Leopold in the San County of Albanac and then was picked up in the 70s by people like Barry Commoner and then Stephen Harding and Animate Earth and so on. So it's a way of becoming participatory Democrats of the life systems on which we all depend. And very famously here at University of Victoria is the work of Nancy Turner, who is an ethnoecologist and probably is the most famous person in the world for seeing this project of reintegration into the life systems that sustain us and move us. There's an animacy in the way life sustains life over these long time periods, and we understand the cycles through uh, life systems theories now, and we have to find ways that are not linear, like our developmental model, don't see ourselves, don't see the ecosystems as externalities, but rather as internalities. So this is a huge transition, but we have scientists across disciplines and an indigenous people working together on what we can call practices of integration, reintegration. And I see again the whole Gandhian movement as one of the early uh, experiments with, with that. Well, uh, Jim, it's, it's, it's wonderful <clears throat> your uh, explanation. In fact, it's interesting because all these uh, uh, Gaia hypothesis, so to say, which is not an hypothesis anymore. Well, in, in fact, everything starts from the 17th century, where the, the dispute or the debate between Descartes and Spinoza. And I think that we are going back to Spinoza with the concept of natura naturans, uh, which is really the Gaia hypothesis before that hypothesis has been formulated. Um, I think that we both focus on reconciliation and conflict. But there are the, the, the nuances are different. Uh, different. That is to say, we are you are more focusing more on reconciliation, and I I'm seeing more and more conflicts today. That is to say, I I I I'm forced to experience a very ugly uh, uh, world. While I was sitting in that room of the Truth Commission, Commission in Colombia. Four elected officials who were assassinated by paramilitary groups. So, in a democracy. So, while we were dealing with the post conflict, the people were being assassinated outside. So, then I went to another city, Barranquilla, and I was, it was delicious, the carnival, of course, which is carnival is very famous in Barranquilla, a very Caribbean city. Again, violence. People on the next morning, so many people assassinated by drug trafficking, by revenge among groups. So this is probably, that's why I have to, in my world, whenever I want to agree fully with you on reconciliation, because we need that, I have to focus also on, on the conflict. And that's why I focus <clears throat> on abyssal exclusions. Again, I think that since the 17th century, there is this abyssal line that divides 
metropolitan sociability from colonial sociability. The metropolitan sociability is the sociability where the universal values of our world are all of them based. But this is part of the world because it doesn't include the colonial sociability, which is out of the picture, is other reality. And these are the side, are the side of subhumanity, of people that are not considered really human. And I give always the example of the labor law, when the 19th century, well, at the end of the 19th century, we were celebrating the beginning of the protection of, uh, of labor, with the, the first social rights of labor. Well, we forget that at the very same time, the European countries were legislating about forced labor in the colonies. So the same process. But our constitutional law, our, our labor law treaties don't speak about the other side. The other side was the forced labor. So I think today, the abyssal line, and that's why I started by saying that it is it was really a big prep and mistake to consider that colonialism was over with independence. And I give you the example. An immigrant, a black immigrant, or an indigenous immigrant in any city here in Europe or in Americas, I, I want to ask about that. Whenever they are employees, for instance, in a restaurant, they are employees in a restaurant in Europe, of course they have rights. So they are in the field of metropolitan sociability. They are considered equal. Of course they are sometimes discriminated. A woman, for instance, probably doesn't get as much money as the man for the same work. But she has rights, and the indigenous immigrant or the African immigrant has rights. But when these people leave the restaurant and cross the street, they very often may be victims of outright violence, police brutality. The, the woman may, may be victim of a gang rape or may be assassinated when she arrives at home. That is to say, these people cross the abyssal line during the day. It is an invisible line. We don't see it, but they see it because they are treated as subhuman from one, from one moment to the next. So I think that our theories in law and politics don't address this invisible line that creates subhumanity. And that's why I think that all the reconciliation has to undo this epistemic recovery of the knowledges that are coming from this other side that has been so much neglected. So the abyssal exclusion is the exclusion without rights. In fact, we, we cannot say that person at that moment has any right because she or he is treated as an object, as a subhuman. Like Salvini says that all these ships with the immigrants, you know, it's just meat. I mean, just leave it out, out in the sea. These people are not people treated as such. They are subhuman beings. Thank you so much, Boventura and Jim. This, this is amazing. Uh, we would like to move on to uh, questions here in the chat box. Um, and I would like to start with Ryan's question. And it's addressed for both of you or either of you, if you want to speak to, me, to it. Uh, and he asked, do you have a more specific diag diagnosis of why democracies are dying democratically now? For why many voters are opting for authoritarian candidates? I think you both agree that capitalism, colonialism, and heteropatriarchy are deep and broad problems. Are you able to offer more specific thoughts on why we are seeing such an authoritarian authoritarian turn currently. Um, and if I may just add, uh, Boaventura, you mentioned in your new book um, uh, the dying of democracy and the uh, democracy's death, democracy of death, right? And the, how democracies are feeding uh, militar militarism and ecological destruction and creating inequalities, right? I wonder if this democracy of death is feeding the death of democracy and what you would have to say.
Well, I think that uh, uh, we have this, we, that is to say, the West have, has destroyed Iraq in the name of democracy. Mm -hmm. We have destroyed Libya in the name of democracy. We are destroying Venezuela in the name of democracy. We are destroying Brazilian democracy in the name of democracy. So this is the way in which democracies are dying democratically because they cannot defend themselves efficiently from the anti-democrats. Why is that? For two reasons, in my view. The first reason, of course, is that power, the structures of power are droneified. Drones, you know, drones, military drones. Well, the media are drones. The financial capital is a drone. They can destroy a country from one day to the next by a manipulation in the stock markets. So don't see them. And the power that is presenting to us after 1980, this, there is no alternative, is becoming not reality. That is to say, in fact, when there is no alternative, the power becomes invisible. It's all powerful, and therefore there is no power. It's the contradiction, because there is no contradiction in power. So power becomes invisible, in a sense. All powerful, all present, like the abyss line, but invisible. So in this process, victims turn against the victims. So the, the white uh, impoverished worker in the United States thinks that his or her enemy is the impoverished Latino worker immigrant from Mexico, from Central America. The impoverished black fellow in South Africa thinks that his or her enemy is the black a poor, impoverished immigrant from Zimbabwe or from Mozambique, as we have had some black, black racism in South Africa. So victim against victim, that's what power wants, because power wants that the victims turn against victims because the oppressor is not there. That's why we occupy the streets, but we cannot occupy the banks. And therefore, I think that we need, in fact, to tackle the issue of financial capital. And if we don't tackle that issue, and that's why, in my view, the country that ostracized socialism throughout the 20th century with so dire consequences for everyone, like the United States, is the country where you see now that socialism is resuscitating with the young Democrats, for instance. What is the meaning of that? is that capitalism is so gross in the United States. So from my office in Madison, from my house to my office, every day I see 20 or 30 people sleeping on the streets. They are the homeless of the United States, Madison, Wisconsin. So all of a sudden, this system is so unjust. And they are not just blacks. They are white people because of the crisis, the financial crisis of 2008 which was all solved by the financial capital. So I think that this is the way the reactionary move takes place, is to turn victims against victims, so that power goes on doing what they want to do. And what they want to do is access to natural resources and do what neoliberalism is. Neoliberalism is a machine, a global machine, to transfer wealth from the poor people to the rich people, everywhere, in Canada, in Portugal, everywhere, with a different degrees, but that's what we are in. And as long as we have a democracy that aims at uh, transferring wealth from the rich to the poor, but a system, a financial system, that is uh, ceaselessly transferring wealth from the poor to the rich, the last one is prevailing, and that's why democracy is dying democratically. Jim, uh, can you unmute your mic, please? Yes, can you hear me? Oh, is this on? Would you like me to say a few things about uh, Ryan's question? Okay, I, 
I think Ryan was also asking a, a more specific question. There's a famous book by Mishra called Age of Anger. And his argument is a lot of the rise of what we could call right populism has been driven by a kind of ressentiment. So what he is, what Mishra is thinking about here and what I think Ryan is asking, if we're going to have one foot in the representative institutions, we have to ask ourselves, how can we win elections? If in fact right populists are, are winning through democratic processes, how do we get in and campaign? What would be the structure of argument? And I think in that case, there is now a lot of comparative work. I mean, there's a big difference between the United States and India and Turkey and so on. And we have to ask, okay, how did right populism rise here and there? And what were the specific factors? And it, if we're trying to think of ways to, to win the next election in these countries, it might be quite, I mean, Boa's very general argument is accurate, but it's not helping, it's not helping us in thinking about what are good campaign strategies. If you take the United States, there's an analysis that a lot of the vote for President Trump was driven by people who felt they were left out and treated as deplorables by the neoliberal uh, uh, hegemons. And they were reacting against that, but they were also blaming their economic conditions, declining economic conditions and social conditions in their community on, as Bob pointed out, immigration. But if you look at the political economy of the situation, I think in many cases the answer is the job losses were due to automation and to outsourcing. And once you understand that and you get it across, then that's going to make a difference in the way you campaign. And the Bernie Sanders movement showed us that it is possible to develop coalitions around social democracy or democratic socialism that speaks to the very same people who would otherwise vote for a right-wing populist. So we have to think hard about contextually, if you see what I mean, about what's going on in a particular country or in Ontario or wherever uh, these turns to the right are taking place and ask ourselves what kind of campaign could uh, create coalitions that would be, have the capacity to actually win elections and connect those to our participatory democracy. May, uh, may I add a, a footnote here, uh, Jim, um, about contextualizing? Um, well, I, I fully agree with you. I mean, I, I fight my struggle in Portugal in a way, uh, and I know how to do it, uh, even though I know, and I'm helping the leftist coalition now in power, and I've been uh, doing the same in Brazil. And I even, I'll offer you, a, it's still only in Portuguese and Spanish, is uh, Lefts of the World Unite. So that my most recent book is about the Lefts of the World Unite. And uh, I hope that that book uh, will publish it in English. It's now in Spanish and in, uh, in Portuguese. Well, it is my concern how the leftist forces can unite uh, in these uh, times. But I think that there are some things that are globally efficient at this point. And uh, probably you are aware of, of, of Cathy O'Neill's book, uh, uh, The Algorithm, uh, uh, A Weapon of Mass Destruction. That is to say, the fake news, the algorithms, Facebook and WhatsApp are now really have to be analyzed deeply. And I give you a very concrete example. In Brazil, 120 million people have only one source of information, the WhatsApp. Only one. They don't read anything else. Just one. And our studies, political science studies, by the best universities in, in Brazil, show us that Brazilians trust two institutions, none of them democratic, the churches and the family. So if a message comes through WhatsApp by robots 
by automated profiles, as they did in Brexit, as Cambridge Analytica is doing. From the family and the church, the people believe it. And it's not the Brazilians because they are ignorant. The, the British people are not ignorant. They were victims of that in Brexit. That was the first attempt. And we are now heading for elections here in Europe for the European Parliament. And everybody is concerned because Steve Bannon is here to try to destroy the European Union. He wants to double the seats of the Eurocetics in the European Parliament using the same techniques of the Cambridge Analytica. So these are global forces that operate contextually in different countries, but they are global instruments. So I think we have also to see that globalization is happening locally more and more. Thank you so much for those answers. In fact, Boa, you connect us perfectly into our next question, which comes to us from Millie, who uh, was reflecting on the kind of dual role of the internet as uh, a place of equality and horizontality where, where we can connect with one another, and also as a place of polarization and manipulation and, uh, and xenophobic populism. And to, she was asking to explore kind of the role that, that this is playing in the current decay of democracy and also in uh, the sort of resistance to the neoliberal project that we're seeing. So I was hoping you could reflect on, on what role the internet plays here. Well, I think Boa has just done it, Keith. I, I would agree with his analysis of Cambridge Analytica and so on, which after all was a, started in Victoria. Uh, so we know a lot about it here. But I felt his analysis was actually very good and I, I don't have anything. Uh, just uh, another footnote. Is, is the following, is, I think it's a very challenging question. And uh, let me say, uh, now let me respond to that in very practical terms, in terms of my struggles as an activist, for instance, now in Brazil, and now in, in, this, uh, in this book on the left. I'm, I'm uh, discussing a lot on going back to the personal, to the community-based as uh, as, uh, as, uh, as Jim was saying, that is to say, I think that the left, particularly in the countries where I'm most familiar with, they do not know they, how to discuss with the people in the peripheries of our cities anymore. They don't share the same language. They don't have the same anxieties of these people. They really celebrate it, uh, liberal the democracy, as if it were the whole world, and left the insecurities of people outside their discourse, their languages. And sometimes were reactionary, very conservative churches, like the evangelical churches in Latin America, throughout Latin America, that took over that. And so they have been fueling a discourse of, of hunger, of hatred, of, and of lies that go with them. So I think we have to go back to the personal. For example, I'm advising the Workers' Party and the Socialist Party in Brazil to go back to the cells. The cells were the community-based organization of these parties in the 80s when they would discuss in the community the, the popular issues, the issues, the political issues, face-to-face. -face. Because face-to-face -face, there is no fake news possible. I look at you and by your smile I know that you are not a robot, that you are not an automated profile. So I can't look at you because we, we, we trust each other by the way we look at, at each other, by the way we smile at each other. So we have to uh, activate our senses. We are too much ocular centric. So we have also to change our perspectives on that. So we have to go back to the personal, in fact, person to person. And if you look at some of the, the campaigns of these young Democrats in the States, they go door to door.
I am trying to, okay. Sorry about that. Yeah, no, I, this, uh, going back to personal, to interpersonal dialogue, discussion in small groups, I think is terribly important. In 2008, I wrote an article on this called uh, uh, Communication and Imperialism, and just how the rise of the World Wide Web was Again, a step of disembedding us from our local communities of conversation and of local knowledge and reinserting us in a very dangerous network over which we have no democratic control. And people just looked at that as if, oh, here's some old fogey, right, still talking about person-to-person uh, -person dialogue. But now we come along in 2019, people saying, boy, now we have to get back to face-to-face -face communication. I think, yeah, well, <laughs> that um, it was a thought, and it was uh, our old friend Pierre Trudeau who uh, first mentioned this to me. Um, very interesting. And I think that's, I, I think a lot of people are finding this absolutely essential, that somehow the toxicity of social media really isn't helping us. In, in more than half of the time, it's quite harmful, and it's that's how fake news gets around. Whereas we can test these ideas if we can sit down and talk with each other. And again, it's this divide between that Boa mentioned between the urban and the rural, and two kind of self understandings of who we are and what counts as progress and so on. And it's if we can get a dialogue going between the rural and the urban on the problems that are facing them, we can get uh, over some of these terrible misunderstandings. Jim, I just, uh, Jim, I just want to say, you know, uh, that I usually say that the following, which I think summarizes well that whenever there is a flood, whenever there is a flood, what we lack most is potable water. So now there is a flood of information. That was a great closure for that question. Mm -hmm. Uh, just uh, changing track a little bit here, Didier uh, Zuniga asked a really interesting question, and it's about Latin America, but um, we could speak uh, about the world in general. So he says, you, uh, Boaventura, you mentioned Colombia and Venezuela and Brazil, among others, uh, and he wonders what you think about the case of Mexico which is largely presented as a triumph of democracy and as a triumph of the left, but political decisions and projects, such as the construction of the so-called Mayan, Mayan train, the construction of an oil refinery, and they did agreements with individuals, and that would arguably violate um, eco-social democratic principles. Um, and I would add to that and ask you, uh, Latin America in general and those uh, projects that have been um, damaging nature and ecological systems in Latin America, uh, South America. It's me. What's up? Well. <laughs> I'm very glad to answer. This is a difficult question, but 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 uh, I'm I'm glad to be able to answer it. Well, in the first decade of the millennium, there were some very good news in Latin America. For instance, Brazil, Ecuador, Bolivia. You know, it was the continent, the only continent, in which we could speak of the socialism of the 21st century. Right. One decade later, it's gone in treasure in most countries. Right? At that period, Mexico was outside our pale because we were Zapatists. In my case, I've been working with Zapatists very close to their struggles. 
and therefore Mexico was there, uh, somewhere else. Now, I think Mexico is the only good news in the continent, is the AMLO finally managed to get elected. But how did he manage to get elected? Well, I, I, I've been working with lots of people that are working and very loyally <clears throat> with AMLO now. For instance, many people, many social scientists in Latin America, that were, we, are, we have this Federation of Plaxo, probably you know, the Federation of Research Centers in Latin America, and many of my friends that were leading the research groups of Plaxo are now members of the government, or are working with AMLO. So there is a hope that some difference, some new thing will occur, right? Well, AMLO, in order to get to power, has to make some alliances, particularly with evangelicals. In, in one month, he has, he has already met twice with the leader of the evangelicals in Mexico. This is, these are bad news. Which means that uh, the women, for instance, are going to be the first victims of that. Of abortion, because it's in the agenda of the evangelicals, and of the productive rights in general. So, there are lots of progressive women that have been working with Hamlo, and they have been put aside. So the first sign of bad news coming from Hamlo could be that. The second one, and the major one, is of course the indigenous issue. And I'm not talking about Zapatistas, because as you know, there are many other groups of indigenous people, they are not uh, united. There was in fact an attempt to build a, an indigenous candidate, Mari Shui, was a very interesting process, but a, a process that failed uh, because uh, we needed 800,000 signatures and they were not available there. So now what we have is what you were saying in your question. That is to say, we have a model of development that is really the only alternative for these governments. That is to say, the idea that in order to distribute some wealth to the poor people, you have to really explore more intensely Mother Earth. That's what we call in Latin America neo-extractivism. That is to say, uh, as you can see, that's why I usually say that this is a continuity with colonialism, because the extractivism is the continuation, direct continuation of colonialism. If you look at Brazil, it has de-industrialized de itself. Mexico is absolutely deindustrialized, except for the, the plants in connection with the U.S. industries. So we see that AMLO is, um, is involved in the same model of development, and I don't see that he sees an alternative to that model. And if he does not see that, he's going to feel very active resistance on the part of the indigenous movement. Not only the Zapatistas, but many in other, in the Carrero, for instance, is going also to find lots of resistance, because there is a tradition of resistance on those. I think that the book is still open. I don't want to be too skeptical about AMLO, because he's a very honest person. He has never been considered corrupt by anyone, and he's trying to do some things. And I've been collaborating with him in one or two. For instance, he has uh, the person in, in charge of, of science policy is a wonderful person. She's trying to make a difference on the scientific priorities of research in Mexico. But I know that she is already being attacked by big capital. So I fear that all the good news that we're hoping for in AMLO's case may turn out to be a frustration, but I'm still hopeful because there are not many cases in which you can be hopeful in Latin America today, so we have to be hopeful in whatever, besides Uruguay, what we... And Would you like to add anything or anything? I wouldn't. I wouldn't, but I...
Yeah, we have five minutes, and I would like to invite Didier to type in, and we can continue this conversation. And if Bovent would allow us to email him and chat a little more about Mexico and Latin America, I would love that. Um, I think we have time for one more question, and I'd like Keith to put it out. Yeah, we're just coming to the end of our time now, so I'll ask you both to answer this one briefly. Uh, but this one comes from Jordan, and I think it was a great question to help us uh, end our discussion on a positive note, really looking forward to how we can, we can all move forward together. And Jordan's asking uh, what the two of you think would help to increase the level of mobilization we're seeing for social justice, and particularly protest and direct action and revolution uh, by civic citizens to hold capital. Well, I'll be very brief. Uh, I really think uh, the way to do this is to uh, return to Gandhi and just uh, refresh our memory of the way of uh, building up an alternative world that he presented to us. And uh, there's a book by Richard Gray called The Power of Nonviolence that I think brought that story from India to North America in the 1930s and 40s. And that huge African-American and civil rights movements of the 50s and 60s was driven by this, what's now called colored cosmopolitanism around the world. And it's a way of bringing together what Boa called demo-democracies. And I think we could I think one thing we can do as academics is think hard about this rich repertoire of nonviolent practices of non-cooperation with extractive, uh, unsustainable systems and turn our attention to cooperating with Well, I, I, I think that, of course, we, uh, first of all, I'd like to, to know whether I'll have access later on to all these uh, chat box, because there are wonderful comments here. Sometimes I get distracted because I'm reading what, uh, what is on the, uh, on the screen, and I'd like to have them on hold for later on, because my baby is responding, and some of them are wonderful comments and the questions. So can I have access to them later on, or they just go away like that? If they don't go away, so I'll, I'll, they stay with me, and that's that's good enough now. Well, I I, I agree with Jim. I, I think that uh, uh, the kinds of mobilization that we need now, the mobilization is there. The problem is that not as visible and they're not as credible as uh, some twenty years ago. Because of the, of the really this uh, uh, monopolization of conservative news, of the entertainment industry, and of the internet, the way in which the, the social networks are being used by the extreme right. And in fact, it poses an ethical problem even for the left. For as we were discussing recently, could we on the left or leftist party in Europe use the automated profiles to counteract the extreme right automated profiles. We cannot. There are ethical issues that we should not be like them. So this poses very, very serious questions to our mobilization. As far as Gandhi, in fact, and now I fully agree with Jim, in fact, in my, in, in my most recent book, The End of Cognitive Empire, I have a chapter on Gandhi precisely on that line, how he inspired the civil rights movement there. But I was taken aback recently. I, it's a long chapter. It's called the Gandhi as inter, inter, Intercultural Translator. You like it. But recently in Nigeria, there was a monument honoring uh, um, Gandhi, and they took it away. 
And I was surprised. Why is that? You know, Gandhi is my hero. So we don't have many heroes these days, right? So what happened is that there is a debate in Africa going on now. It's raging. Whether, in fact, Gandhi was racist vis-a-vis the black people in Africa. And he was, in fact, we know that. Be- before he wrote the Insparaj in 1904, he has lots of comments in which we can see that. But then he changed. And he changed, in my view, if you read the 100 books, I didn't read the 100 books of Gandhi literature, but I have read many of them. And in fact, you can see that the increasing trend is anti-racist in general, and that's why the civil rights black people, some of them, even Martin Luther King, didn't believe that at first. It was brought to him from India. So it's very interesting, this process. But the problem is there. In fact, if you go excavate the work of Gandhi and even the questions of castes in India, sometimes we have a more nuanced picture of Gandhi. So in order to be Gandhians, we have to be beyond Gandhi. In order to be Marxist, we have to go beyond Marxists, beyond Marx. And that's the way I think my Gandhian way is to go beyond the Gandhian, because I want to see where, which are my black spots. That is to say, my monsters that are so banal and so obvious to me that I don't see them. But they are monstrosities. So that's why I... Thank you so much. That was such a perfect way to close our discussion, I think, with this emphasis on uh, on the actual possibilities all around us and the alternative worlds that are being enacted by by marginal pockets of resistance all over that, uh, that we don't have to imagine a better future. There's actually one in the making already. And I couldn't think of a more fitting thought on a day when there are global climate strikes all over the world today being led by the youth. There's one right here in Victoria at the legislature as we speak. Uh, and it's really a touching reminder that you don't have to look far to find the, the other world that we're searching for. Very sadly, this is all the time we have for our, our Q&A discussion today. But uh, please stay connected with us and, and keep the conversation going moving forward by following us on social media. We'll make sure to collect the questions that we didn't get to and uh, and give them to Jim and Boa so that they have the benefit of those in their own time. And I would like to, we would like to thank you, Jim, and thank you, Boaventura. It's, it's such a pleasure and honor to uh, be present in this dialogue. Um, thank you so much for making the time, your precious time to do this. Uh, this is inspires us and encourages encourages us as new scholars. Um, thank you so much. And Boventura, the questions and the comments will be available for you and for you, Jim, if you would like to have access to them. Uh, and thank you for everyone in the room that has participated, that has uh, made questions and comments.